Welcome to Conversations with Peter Bogosian. I am absolutely delighted to speak to James Fishback. I have uh, been waiting for this conversation for quite a long time because I think that we are going to uh, be participating in something together. So, James, tell us a little bit about yourself before we jump right into it. Well, thank you, Peter. I've long admired your work and have been following you for years, and so it's really an honor for me to be thank here. You. I'm overrated. <laughs> <laughs> I I did high school debate from 2009 to 2013 at a public high school down in South Florida. High school debate changed my life. It was not just an extracurricular. It was really opening my mind to so many different possibilities that I hadn't previously entertained. I also had a speech impediment growing up, and so it helped me get rid of that and, uh, and speak with more confidence publicly. But I, I came back to high school debate as a volunteer coach after college in 2017, and an event, an activity that had transformed my life had transformed into something that I barely recognized. It had been totally hijacked by this illiberal leftism that punished students for what they said and how they said it. Kids were disqualified for disagreeing, um, for saying things that you or I could say in just a, a normal conversation, things that you could have said even five years ago. And right. so it just became a point where I had to really create an alternative, which is called incubate debate, which is a free speech high school debate alternative. And I've, I've written about this recently in the free press about how at high school debate. Yeah. That, no argue, that article, uh, that article was fantastic. Okay. So let's, let's drill down on this and just to contextualize this, I, um, I debated very, very seriously in high school and I debated very, very seriously in college and I loved it. I had a great time. It was one of those things that was instrumental to my intellectual development. I really enjoyed it. I enjoyed testing my ideas out. So one of the, I think this is so important for, for so many reasons, but briefly, can you give us, so, so you said that illiberal leftism, is it, what is it? The content of the debate is subject to kind of some kind of speech code or the judges base make adjudicate who wins and who loses based on something. Explain that to us, would you please? Absolutely. It, it's a whole range of things that can start off with the judges, what the judges are doing. So historically, judges publish these online profiles called paradigms. And when I was in high school debate, a paradigm might say something like, Peter, before the round, don't speak at 300 words a minute. And I would prefer that you use primary instead of secondary source evidence. But what, what they've become now is they've become these sort of purity tests where mm. judges are telling students the types of arguments they will not listen to, that will never win, that will result essentially in their disqualification. Take this one judge, for example, Peter. Her name is Lila Lavender. She's judged over a thousand rounds of debate in the past couple of years. And right. her paradigm reads, instead of being a debate judge, I want to make clear that I am a Marxist Leninist Maoist. I can't <laughs> check my ideology at the door. Therefore, if you make the following arguments, uh, pro-Israel, pro-capitalism, pro-police, you will lose the round no matter what. That's what she tells students before the debate. Or the one judge who says that if you merely use the word illegal immigrant to describe, you guessed it, illegal immigrants, that you would also lose the debate. And so you are actually punishing students, not because of their logic, their evidence, their reasoning, any of that. You're just taking a line in the sand and saying, if you make any argument that I personally find detestable, which is antithetical right. to debate, you will lose. Right, right, right. Okay, so this is so I, – I, I could literally talk to you about this for hours. So this – everything you said was just utterly fascinating to me. Okay, so first of all, there is something to be said for somebody who's completely honest about the criteria that they lay out, you know, and right. – there's something to that, but in the context of a debate, it's not that you check your ideology. It, 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 you have to check your ideology at the door, right? You have to listen to the best arguments, who has the best evidence, who has the best rebuttals and counters. And so is there a way that somebody looks at that and says, wow, this this and I had actually heard of her. I think I maybe I read it in your your Barry's piece that you wrote. But yeah. is there some kind of like hierarchical structure where somebody looks at that? Some somebody in the, what is the name of the? Is there like an accrediting body or what's the name of the debate body? Yes, it's the National Speech and Debate Association. 
Okay, I think that's the same as when I was in it. Okay, and so don't they look at that and they they say, okay, this person is 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 an ideological lunatic, and and we're not going to let them judge, or or that, is that whole you, is it all ideologically captured the whole institution? The, unfortunately, the whole institution is ideologically captured. Let's just give them, for argument's sake, Peter. Let's give them the benefit of the doubt. They had okay. no idea about the judges that I reported on in, in two articles for the free press. And thank you again to Barry and her team for publishing that. Let's just assume they had no idea. Well, we brought it to them. We brought it to right. them. And we said, look, you have judges here who are saying things like, if you are white, don't talk about how certain policies affect minorities. Right. And give them the benefit of the doubt. When they put out a statement 48 hours later after this article went viral, they did not condemn reprimand, remove the judges who said that right. they cannot be impartial. I have no issue, and I don't think you do either, with some uh, leftist or even some right, whoever, judging a high school debate, if they Correct. can show that they can be impartial. The problem wasn't necessarily the judges were saying, although it was a problem, was saying that that they were of a, po a, of a particular political persuasion. The problem is they were saying that they could not check that at the door, and they were right. specifically saying they would not evaluate and thus ever vote for certain arguments. And so what was more damning than the article itself, to tell you the truth, Peter, was the National Speech and Debate Association's response, which was no response. You had right. judges which were clearly breaking their own rules, bastardizing the debate, making it a political test as opposed to an educational one. And that is where, I think that was the proof that this was a totally corrupted organization. Right. So we see this over and over again. Once critical social justice makes its way in, it's a universal solvent that overrides the mission statement of institutions. Not to ride this hobby horse, but I think one of the most fascinating things that's happening today is the Claudine Gay plagiarism scandal. I just, I find this yeah. absolutely fascinating. Here is an institution. I mean, look what they did for Larry Summers, who was, by, by the way, Jewish. In, an, in a sane world, I wouldn't have to mention that, but we don't live in a sane world. So sure. it is fascinating to me, the people who are coming out saying that if there's anything as a sin in, in academia, it would be plagiarism, saying that this is some kind of a, a racist witch hunt, that you know the, the faculty are coming out and supporting her. There is large scale institutional corruption in our society, legacy institutions, and it's literally unicausal. It's social justice ideology, critical social justice ideology. Okay. So I know we're going to be having this conversation and I don't even know how many people are going to listen to this and say, James is full of shit. Bogosian is just, he's making stuff up. This, none of this stuff is true. This isn't happening. So we actually have some evidence that I would like to play from actual high school debates. But before Reed plays these, could you just give us some context, please? What was the resolution? What was this about? Absolutely. So these tournaments were from the most prestigious high school debate tournament in the country, which is the Tournament of Champions. It's held every April. And the topic for the first video is about whether the IMF's costs outweigh its benefits. So it's about the International Monetary Fund and this is the most, this is the final round, the final round to determine the national <laughs> champion in 2021. Uh, okay, Reed. Demonstrators demand that New York City do more to help those suffering from AIDS. Resistance took the form of non-cooperation. Demonstrators had to be dragged to paddy wagons, many shouting as they were carried away. Do you think you really accomplished a great deal? Yes, I think we do. What else can we do? I've done everything. I've called everybody. I've got appointments with everybody. I've got to come to City Hall and save my case. We're dying. The city is dying. I don't know that man's name, but I know a little of the hopelessness and the horrible sinking fear in his voice. Here's how I prepped for the TOC. I woke up a week before and learned that 28 instead of 27 states wanted to kill me. The clip I played is from the 1987 ACTA protest in New York City. It was not the first and certainly not the last demonstration of its kind. It joins a tradition of trans and queer protest against institutions and to re reform communities that are violent and exclusive. We are here to join this tradition in our own small way. So 
welcome to the protest. We are tired of how debate treats trans people. More than that, we are tired of the way that their treatment is normalized, how it is treated as a necessary byproduct of having de good discourse. When a nationally ranked team is bold enough to read arguments and make trans people uncomfortable in front of an 11 person panel and not be called out for it, something needs to change. When a trans kid can go three years in debate believing being misgendered was simply something he needed to take in order to win ballots, something needs to change. When almost every trans person quits debate or considers quitting several times a month, several times a week, several times a day, something needs to change. Change. First, the framework. Status quo political discourse remains fixated on the notion of the child, symbol of a future society we must protect. Bait in 12. Politicians universally frame their debaters around the question of what policies are best for children, who, keep, who keeps the child safest. Politics, however, <laughs> supposedly <laughs> radical, is simply the universal movement of submission to the ideal of the future, to preserve, maintain, and upgrade the structures of society and to proliferate them through for all for the sake of the children. It is for this reason queerness finds itself missing from political discourse. Sound familiar? It should. Yeah. Still having abstract policy debates in as violent and exclusionary a community as this constitutes something like reproductive futurism. They're obsessed with the continuation of a society for future generations while ignoring violence okay, okay we get the message like okay read we get the message and i just want to be crystal clear james i just want to be clear that was supposed to be a debate and those are champion debaters the most prestigious debate about the imf that's exactly right the debate by the way it's a really important topic right there's people on the left who argue and perhaps sometimes credibly that the imf is responsible for a lot of suffering in the world poverty depravity because we should of have that policy. conversation. Sure, Absolutely. We should have that and, conversation. And there's folks on the right who have another side. And so it's actually a really important debate. And so what this team did was they rejected the topic wholesale and they said, you know what's more important than the IMF? The fact that MAGA Republicans <laughs> are trying to kill trans people. And so they hijacked the entire debate. The other team, which was of men, they decided not even to, to take the other side because they would be deemed transphobic. And so, Peter, no joke, they conceded the final round of the Tournament of Champions, something that had never been done before, and then had an open and safe conversation about what it means to be transgender in debate. The team that pushed the trans topic, they were the national champions because of this. And the, the judges, the three judge panels that you just saw there, they, they commended them for their bravery and for their courage of rejecting the topic and talking about transgenderism instead. This is what high school debate is about. Sorry, I have to keep my composure. Okay. <laughs> okay, Reed, let's get, get, James, give us some context for the next wonderful clip we're gonna listen to. Who are these, who are these champions? So this is actually from the same tournament and hmm. same topic about the IMF. But this time, <laughs> the, the students make their argument not about the merits of the IMF. They make their argument about the race, the skin color of their opponents. And that's why they should lose. This is the semifinal round of the 2020 Tournament of Champions. Okay, Reed, let's see. Let's see what the best arguments are debater on their team which inherently means they have more whiteness than us we obviously know that jj is not white it's pretty obvious go down onto our pick we give you three words why we subsume all of their protests and affirm their protests in a pick what it means is you are furthering their cause just minus the whiteness as rebecca is a vehicle for this movement we say whiteness means really bad for representation in queer people and it's a bad form of furthering this protest the best way to further the protest is to vote for our pick and to affirm it but minus the whiteness they say that we're taking over J JJ's labor, but first, this is a new response. If they read this response before, we probably would have read a cap pay about how you can't like use labor across identity lines. That's a really bad thing to do. Second, how picks work is you affirm their protest. We're not taking over their labor. It's just a technicality of debate. Then they say that it's trans exclusion. No, couple responses that they dropped from Sanji. One, our constructive speech was about personal experiences, about our identity. We are not comfortable discussing our sexuality on a live stream with 130 people. Second, we say that like um, them telling us how we should represent our advocacy feeds into our link about racism because a white person and someone on a white team should never be telling two women of color how they should be furthering their advocacy. That's an independent link into our whiteness argument that gets dropped. You can drop them right now. They say we should have read things about the, about the Hall of Shame. It's an identity cave. We are not trans debaters. We don't, don't want to do that. Also, they don't put anything about women of color or queer women of color in their case, which means they also link it to the exclusion. There's no independent offense off of this. Then, at the bottom, all these stuff about the Louisville Project, their racist rhetoric and using the black labor as a way to further their advocacy 
see it's inherently racist as an independent reason to drop them. They say JJ wrote the argument, but no, Rebecca is a vehicle of the movement. You should never use a white person who is saying the Louisville Project and using it as an example of their advocacy in order to further a movement. Then using black suffering to advance at the tournament is just a bad thing to do. Then they say that, oh, um, that, that it's just an example. A white person just shouldn't use a black person's suffering as an example of their advocacy. That's inherently a racist thing to do. And it's too late to respond to this argument in final focus. And it's the largest dropped argument. There's also another dropped argument that links it to racism about how they're telling us how to represent our advocacy. Holy shit. Well, I have to say in her defense, she would be a phenomenal uh, student at Harvard or Yale or maybe she UPenn. Would. She'd be great. She, they, they'd, they'd take one look at her and they'd fast track her tenure track. Boom. Her whole, she'd be, she'd be fantastic. <laughs> Yeah, she yes. she would be. Uh, she has her whole a, a, a career in academia ahead of her. That young lady is truly remarkable. Okay, so what do you think the consequence? Did they win? The, who won that debate? The other team did, but I would say that the the judges in that video still praised the students on both teams for making good arguments. And so, <laughs> while while it's easy, Peter, to look at that young woman Ugh. and say she's talking like a deranged lunatic. We should really point our finger to the judges, these oh, so-called sure. adults in the room who are not for just sure. allowing this, but for your viewers, they are encouraging and rewarding this. Let's just be honest. If we saw that debate, Peter, and we were judging, it would have been over. You don't address the topic. You don't debate the topic. You lose. It's that simple. 99% of Americans would agree with that. But it's the 1% of the illiberal leftists who have totally hijacked high school debate. They're the ones who are saying you win for being brave because you're attacking someone for being white or because you're talking about transgenderism as opposed to debating the topic before us. And so uh, honestly, I squarely yeah, blame sir. the adults. Yeah, I mean, truly, if I saw that debate, I would be so confused. I would not even between i i would be befuddled if i saw i would literally think that the, that someone came in from an insane asylum or they found the wrong meant they escaped from a mental hospital and they kind of kidnapped the debate i would be so confused so i i want to take what you said and and i want to linger on this for a second and i want to go up one tier so it can't just be that the problem is with the judges because there's an authority that puts the judges in there that's right so it the problem has to be at the very, very top, right? That's the right. problem has to be the organization who's responsible for this. I don't even know what the word is, total insanity. I mean, that was just insane. So, was, so like, yeah, yeah. So, so okay, okay, so let's take a step back. So you tell me your thoughts on this. Here's, there are so many problems with this. This is why I won't have this conversation with you for a long time now. You correct me if any of my reasoning is in error, okay? So one of the problems with this, forgetting, leaving aside the fact that this is just completely deranged, is that you have people, the people who won those debates, and even the people who lost to get that far and to have laudatory comments from the debate judges, they think they're good debaters. They do. So, you, so they're going into a, into the world with a skill set and a confidence that is completely unwarranted. That's right. So you're creating people. This act, this institution, and I'm going to blame it on the institution, is creating people who are completely beholden to this ideology. They go out into the world. They think that they're credentialed or justified in making these arguments. And in fact, they're making complete fools of themselves and probably doing irreparable. Now, maybe not irreparable, sometimes irreparable, but but uh, serious social harm. Is that would you agree with that? I would agree with that completely. They're being surrounded in an echo chamber that tells them and rewards them for attacking people on the basis of immutable characteristics, on the basis of, in one case, in my second article for the Free Press, a young man was attacked by the other team because he had tweeted a defense of the First Amendment weeks prior to the actual tournament. They dug it up. The debate was about U.S. water policy. Peter, they dug up one of his tweets and said, my opponent is an unmitigated racist, therefore he should lose. And yeah. guess what the judge said? I agree. Your opponent is an unmitigated racist. 
he should lose and then went on to give him the loss. And so they're being rewarded for the very toxic and destructive things right. that are tearing our country asunder. Right. And so that's why I strongly believe that our institutions cannot be reformed. And that's also why, to bring it back what I said before, I believe Claudine Gay is the perfect person to hold that position. And I do not want her to be fired from Harvard. I think that she is published 11 things and she's plagiarized half of them. And she, the most astonishing thing is she plagiarized her acknowledgments. So what better person than the president of the most prestigious university, the most prestigious, not only leg legacy institution, she's ideal. I don't think this institution can be reformed. I think it's been overtaken by ideology. I think these people are total lunatics. Um, the question is what to do about it. <clears throat> but before we do that, I want to play one more clip. Can you contextualize this clip for us, please? Yes. Different topic. The resolution was about uh, the U.S. policy in the Middle East, whether it was a, whether the U.S. should pull out of the Arab states in terms of its military presence. And so the students, again, reject that topic in its entirety. Let's play <laughs> this one through the end because you're actually going to hear directly from the judge who has some very congratulatory words for the students. Okay. The industrial complex has been coupled with American Christianity, the worship of the weapons of whiteness. Thus, we demand that the U.S. remove its military presence from the Middle East to end our senseless crusade. Scholars are the starting point for any horrible policies. We have tolerated 40 years of Christian conservatism. It must end now. Endorsing our advocacy instead of banal parroting right-wing rhetoric is the only way we can demand an end to Pope Donald's crusade. Our argument, simply put, is that religion and politics is inevitable, as the United States was built to be a city upon a hill for white Christians. American Christianity has controlled all aspects of politics, such as justifying slavery. We solved by decoupling weapons and warships and ending the crusade. White Christians literally inscribe scriptures onto their weapons, worshiping through war. We demand that white Christians be held accountable for America's original sin. The negative continues the trend in politics while whiteness devours the other. By voting for us, the judge will send his signal to political leaders and condemn Christianity in politics. Debating this topic is irrelevant while society is dominated by white Christians. Even if we have something educational to say about this topic, the political will just pray it away and continue their mission to conquer the world in the name of Jesus Christ. How can we compromise with people who think that the Lord demands their policies? Political leaders cannot reasonably do the af or neg based on educational re reasoning when, re when religion dominates politics. This is especially important right now since Mike Pence spends his days praying instead of responding to the looming threats of an Iranian invasion and the Middle East sponsors state sponsored or and the and media spew state sponsored Islamophobic rhetoric. The role of the ballot is to vote for the team that best combats Christian militarism. The link is that the US military is being choked by white Christianity, affirmed to reject our senseless crusade on Holy Land heretics by removing Pope Donald's vehicle of war. The impact is that religious war against non Christians justifies severe dehumanization of Muslims because we frame them as ruthless threats. Our advocacy is that we should remove religion from weapons and remove religion from the military. If we decouple religion and the military, then we can actually allow the US to use its military to make good action. Right now, using uh, using religion to justify military conflict in the Middle East is what's justifying crusade that specifically dehumanizes people and otherizes people who are non-Christian. But the moment we can, but the moment we can decouple religion and military, that's when we can actually use the military to make good change. That ends up that being ends a two-one two. for Livingston. The affirmative tells me, in summary and final focus, that the role of the ballot for me is to reject Christian militarism. So at the end of the day, I'm left with deciding which side I think is better, doing a better job rejecting Christian militarism. So speechless. I'm speechless. I mean, I guess, I guess if there weren't so much at stake, particularly with that region and how important it is, you know, I, I, I guess my stomach wouldn't be turning if they were talking about, you know, how many eggs to put in your cookie batter, right? But these are very significant conversations right. that we have to have in a democracy, that we that have to inform public policy, and and these young kids are are putatively the leaders the the people who are who have these conversations this is this is just a corrupt cesspool um so before i get on my hobby horse of destroying all legacy institutions do you think that the that the this uh, the governing body can be what's the name of the governing body again the national speech and debate association we knew it as the national forensics leagues back pre-2014 Okay. Do you think that can be reformed? Is there any possibility that the, it can be reformed, that the ideology can be exterminated? I, I held out hope for a long time. I tried to push reforms uh, prior to writing these articles, prior to starting my alternative high school debate league called the Incubate Debate. I don't think so at this point. I think they're so far gone. When the articles came out, they chose not to condemn the judges, not to condemn what was happening. There was no self-awareness. And as you can imagine, and as you know from the work that you've done, Peter, if you're stuck in denial, 
nothing can happen from there. Accepting where you are is a precondition to getting out of the rut that you're in. The NSDA has had no shred of acceptance to just how badly they've corrupted this great American tradition of high school debate. Yeah, and it is a it is a great American tradition. Um, so okay, so there's just so much here. Okay, so is it that this organization has kind of wormed its way into, like, if, if someone I can't tell you what my, what my location is here now, but say I'm in Nebraska. And I'm at a at a high school in, in you know Lincoln. Is it all going to be and I, and I want to do debate? Is that the governing body that controls? Like, is it is it is that that one institution? Anyone wants to go, do debate, they go through that. Is that how it works? Well, the National Speech and Debate Association is effectively the governing body. So they host, they set the rules, they set the national topics, they set the standards for judging. And they have the online platform where judges register and where they conduct the judging process in terms of balloting, in terms of uh, the actual adjudication of it and the rankings and the points. So yes, in some way, shape or form, the NSDA is influencing debates that are happening in Nebraska, in Florida, in Michigan. As we move up to the national level, they're obviously going to have more influence. But Peter, ask yourself and to your viewers as well. The, a freshman in high school, a young girl who is interested in debate, and she says, hey, I wonder who won nationals last year. And she says, cool, a debate about the IMF. And there's just this total nonsense <laughs> about transgenderism. And by the way, if you have reasonable arguments about transgenderism, let's have a debate about trans health care. I For welcome sure. that. We should have that debate. If you want to protest, there's a time and there's a place, but you don't go to a math competition and say, you know what, math is racist, and then beat Pox instead, and then you're handed the championship trophy. That's not meritocratic at all. And so I'm not disagreeing, although I have serious disagreements with, with their position on transgenderism, I'm not disagreeing with their protest. This was just not the place. And for the adults in the room to reward it is what is so concerning to me, Peter, is that to the hundreds of thousands of kids who want to participate in this extracurricular, they're being shown, hey, this is what excellent debaters look like. And then they emulate that and it correct. spreads and it's so pervasive. That was perfectly said. That's absolutely correct because they emulate the winners, the people who won, and that's the behavior that they model going forward. I know we, we redid a poll of people who think that it can be reformed. I have no idea how that's possible, but let's, let's drill down on this. So you, you mentioned the word meritocratic. These people, they don't believe in meritocracies. They're the enemy no. of meritocracy. In fact, I just tweeted out something in which um, uh, the Supreme Court's uh, recent ruling, uh, colleges and universities can't use race as a consideration. So they've redefined uh, merit that they, they've coupled race with merit. So being of a certain race is inherently meritorious. So these people are the en enemies of merit or of, of merit. And let's be clear about that. They want to demean the meritocracy. The other thing that you said that there's just, there's just so much here. That, one of the reasons I find this topic particularly interesting is because we can just get our hands around it. Like we can grip it. Unlike right. colleges of education, which is such a significant problem. I mean, th this is something that's easy to do, easy to think about. Okay, so um, I think I know the answer to this, I'm pretty sure, but I'm going to ask you anyway. Is the reason that they don't have topics like um, should we transition children under 18 or should ch children under 18 be allowed to transition is the reason for that because they already know the right answer to the question and they can't even have a debate on it? That's my thinking. Is that correct? That's exactly correct. And so this goes to the other side of how corrupted this organization has become. Let's just put the judges aside for a second. Let's okay. put the hijacking and the rejection of the assigned topic to the side. Let's talk about the topics they do have and the topics they don't have. Mm. What will they debate? Well, here's one debate they had recently. It wasn't about whether affirmative action was good or bad. The question that students had to answer, Peter, was how has affirmative action helped Black Americans? How has affirmative action helped Black Americans? That's perfect. That that that's perfect. That that says it all right there. That tells you everything. And so they're not willing to have a debate about affirmative action being good or bad on its merits because in their mind there's only one right answer. If right. they have a debate about transgenderism with minors, 
that would be unsafe because all the right. evidence, according to them, is is one way. They certainly wouldn't let you debate whether there's a climate emergency or not. And so that is the problem as well, is that the topics that they do, here's one topic, for example, voter ID, I think is a really important topic. I do as there's, well. There's interesting arguments on both sides. I agree. Uh, I, I have personal arguments myself as a conservative, but here's how they framed the voter ID topic. Should the U.S. end oppressive voter ID laws? You see how they put the thumb on the scale there, Peter? They can't right. just say voter ID. They have to narrate. And they have to remind students that these laws are oppressive. And no wonder when it came to me judging one of those debates on that topic, all but one student was on the same side. And that's not really a debate if there's no point and counterpoint. And yeah. so yeah. they're not going to debate transgender. They're not going to debate affirmative action. They're sure as heck not going to debate whether Claudine Gay should stay at Harvard. I'm actually intrigued by your position. I think it's a very interesting one. And so part of debate is we actually have to be able to debate the issues freely and fairly, that is actually how we get to some semblance of truth. Okay, so I'll throw this out to you. I've said <clears throat> some version of this repeatedly, <clears throat> and I want to see if you agree. Feel free to push back on literally anything I say, and I, I mean that most sincerely. I think it's better to not do something that's bad than to do something that's bad. So, for example, I think it's better to not engage in this type of debate then it is to engage in it because if you engage in it, you'll engage in poor ways of thinking. So it's better off not given this eggs, what's exit, it's better off to not do this at all than it is to do it. Do you agree with that? I do agree with that. I okay. do agree with that. I agree in large part because we just saw the videos. If, if, if let's just say I, we had no, I gave you no context. You didn't right. even know it was a debate round. We would have 15 different answers as to as as to what that acts to what that video actually was of. a comedy, a parody, some parody, some kind of online burlesque. protest, some things. But you would, the last thing people would have guessed was that it was an, the championship round of the most prestigious high school debate tournament. Correct. And so, if you can't even put a finger to what it is that that is supposed to represent, it is bad. It is totally betrayed what it represents, which is critical thinking, education and really viewpoint diversity, that can't be something that's good. And so when I think about what that round represented, there's no valuable skills that those students flexed by doing what they did, by attacking Christians, by attacking people for being white, by hijacking the assigned topic and saying, you know what, screw the IMF. That's not an important topic, even though it absolutely is, and both progressives and conservatives would agree with that. We're going to talk about transgenderism. There is nothing of value, <laughs> nothing educational in what we just saw. So yes, those mm. students would be much better off not having done whatever they called debate and done something, done tennis or done chess instead. Or, or um, I would even say, look at a wall. Probably. Watch grass grow. Would yeah, have been exactly. Better than doing that. <clears throat> so we agree on that. Okay, so <clears throat> we have a very significant problem on our hands and I'm I'm happy to have that conversation about why I think Claudine Gay is the perfect person, and uh, I'm I'm working behind the scenes to do my best to keep her at Harvard, and I'm very serious about that. I think I could not possibly pick a better representative for that position, someone who plagiarizes their acknowledgments. I mean, <laughs> that is another level. I yeah. mean, that is just that is truly another level. Um, okay, so I I wanna I wanna talk about the task before you is non-trivial to say the yeah. least, right? So you have to get these lunatics out. You have to make it so that, t tell me the name of your of what you're trying, wh what's the name of it, of what you're doing again? Incubate Debate, which is both the name and what we're literally trying to do is we're trying to actually incubate debate in America, make debate great again, essentially. Yeah, that's one of the most important things. Uh, that th That's, th again, you're not talking about anything radical. You're just talking about when, when I was debater, when you were debater, when we were debating. Right. Uh, it, it, we, we've seen a hijacking of what that means. Okay, so you this is a non-trivial task. I'm going to ask you two questions. One, how do you intend to do this? And two, you mentioned that you were a conservative. Are there any liberals or people on the left pushing back against this? Or, or is it just a who's pushing back against this? A lot of liberals and a lot of progressives on the left are doing it. And I'm really proud 
to have their support because this is not about left or right. This is simply Correct. about what is educational. There is no educational value, Peter, in the last three videos that we saw. There's no educational value in sending your kids to these tournaments to be punished, criticized, and admonished for having views that are not in keeping with the judge's social critical justice theories. And so right after the articles came out, I mean, let's be yeah. honest, they were published by Barry Weiss, who's not exactly a conservative, but is a classical liberal in the sense yeah. that you and I are a classical liberal. We right. value merit. We value truth-seeking, discourse, debate, epistemology. And so, yes, Larry Summers, Ro Khanna, a whole host of, of Democrats and progressives shared this work and really were outraged by what was very blatant view, viewpoint censorship by the National Speech and Debate Association. So I'm, I'm glad to have their support. And what I'll say as to how we're going to do it is okay, I'm- Can you pause there for one second yeah. before, before you say that? I, I, I should not ask compound questions. Reed keeps telling me how to do that. But um, what, the other thing that I think is so damaging about this is I think it's bad for the country. I think it doesn't yeah. allow us to genuinely engage- and we need to be doing this in our academies, in our school systems. It doesn't allow us to generate. I mean, the Middle East is one of the most important issues. The IMF, I don't know if it's the one of the most, but it's certainly within the top 50. In other words, it's it, it, it's an important issue that we have to have a conversation about. And when you have people who are simply not having that, I mean, intentionally not having that conversation. I mean, that's the other thing. It's not only it's not like they're not talking about it. It's like that they're intentionally not talking about it. <clears throat> have you noticed, by the way, uh, I, I've seen this in a couple of Senate hearings. Have you noticed that uh, it's a thing now when someone has asked a question and someone's people have done this to me a few times and they answer another question and I'll say to them, well, you didn't answer my question. And they said, well, I chose not to answer that question. I answered another question. So they, they basically made up a question in their own mind right. and answered a question that I didn't even, I wasn't even asking. I mean, the whole point of, I mean, it'd be like asking someone with a watch, you know, do you know what time it is or something? And they say, yes, it's even worse than that. I mean, it's just this weird dialogue has been bastardized. Discourse has been perverted. Have you noticed that as well? And I can't help but to think that that's, all of this is um, causally related to the ideology. It, all of it is. And what's happening in high school debate, Peter, is a microcosm of what is happening all across the country. We yeah. just don't debate as a country anymore. Correct. Look at what happened in COVID, the way they rigged the COVID debate online and social media. You weren't allowed to say that forced masking of kids was going to harm their development. You weren't allowed to talk about the forced shutdown of schools being harmful to young students, especially to young women and their mental health. You weren't allowed to talk about the increase in myocarditis for young men from the second shot or from the booster. And so not having debate quite literally ruined people's lives during the pandemic. We are, are, we are the best as a country when we are able to come together and have an open and civil dialogue about the issues that afflict us. I and completely so, agree. That that's what motivates me in thinking about high school debate. I mean, I don't okay. think that everyone who shared this article was necessarily concerned about what is happening in this particular niche area of, of high school extracurriculars. I think they saw it as a microcosm of what is happening all over the country, from the corporate boardroom to the classroom at a university, to the president's office at Harvard, to the online rigging during uh, the during the pandemic. That, that's what's really concerning for social media as well. Okay, let, let me, uh, I'm going to alienate nine-tenths of my audience here, or eight-tenths of them, and I might piss you off, but I'm going to tell you something that I found. There's no question in my mind from being intimately involved in the space from the moment I wake up to the moment I've gone, I go to bed, that the anti-woke movement is itself becoming a kind of woke movement. It's becoming a massive echo chamber, it has um, echoes of very strong Christian nationalism. And I'm not talking about, I'm talking about actual Christian nationalism. Um, it's, it's creating a kind of echo chamber where saying anything against, it's developing its own kind of moral fashions in opposition to what, what people have. And my question to you is, and this is dovetails into you know how how you want to accomplish your goals. My question to you is, what can you do to make sure that this doesn't become a a different kind of echo chamber? 
It's a good question. And I'm, I'm glad that you, you posed it the way that you did, because it's really important. Um, I got to tell you, I was just with, uh, we're at a, 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 a not our retreat for our, for incubate debate right now. We're in Orlando. We just spent a couple days together. And I, I asked the team, I said, we did some drills and I said, what if you had a student, we always begin our tournaments with the pledge of allegiance. And I said, what if you had a student who refused to stand for the pledge and one of your colleagues admonished them and then that student and their coach came up to you, what would you do? And so it's pretty clear what you would do. We abide at Incubate Debate by the First Amendment. And that means that you have a right not to stand for the Pledge of Allegiance, not Correct. to be compelled into something. It's our right to encourage you to do that, to stand for the pledge ourselves. And it's your right to not do that if you so choose. And so I'm an unapologetic conservative, but I'm coming at this from somebody who is unapologetically a free speech absolutist. And that means the speech that I like and that I don't like, setting a standard, bringing really great stakeholders who are both conservative and progressive, but believe in the classic liberal principles of someone like a John Stuart Mill, that this is about the marketplace of ideas. And so I, I agree with you. I don't want to become the anti-woke alternative to high school debate. I certainly don't want a conservative judge coming in here and canceling a student because they're pro-choice or because uh, they want an open border. If you want to make those arguments, you better have the right evidence, logic, and reasoning to do so. Otherwise, you're going to lose. If you do have those arguments with the logic, logic, evidence, and reasoning, then guess what? You should win, but based on merit and merit alone, not the judge's own personal ideology. Okay, so getting back to that woman who that lavender person judge. So if you if if you're you're the head you're the head of the organization, right? I am. Yes. Okay, so if if you saw the same statement, but with principles you completely agreed with, you know. I'm I, I don't know what your position on immigration or abortion is, but whatever whatever they were. And, and and the person said, I cannot leave my principles at the door. Would you let that person be a judge for you? Absolutely not. Okay. So that right there is that's the difference. That's the difference. Okay. That's so difference. yeah. And and so that part of it is too, it's not just the rules. The NSDA, Peter, they say all the right things. In their rule book, it says that a judge should adjudicate the round before them, leaving their politics at the door. The problem is, is the selective enforcement of those rules. Let's just do a quick exercise in our minds sure. for a sec. If that yeah. judge had said, I am a, a MAGA America first conservative, and if you make any <laughs> argument that is pro-choice, pro defund the police or pro open border, you will lose. They would be kicked out of there in 15 seconds, right? And so let's be honest, it's free speech for me, but not for thee. Correct. And so part of it is, yeah, we've got to enforce those rules that incubate debate. And so yes, if a conservative judge said, I cannot check my conservatism at the door and I cannot be impartial, then they're out. Everybody has biases. You have biases. I have biases. Sure, of course. Opposed to certain sides. But the thing is, Peter, we're coming into this as an educational exercise so we can reward students who have done the research, who have worked weeks and months to prepare, not to reward the students who fit the political requirements that we have set out before the debate. And so we, one, we make a really conscious effort to bring in as much viewpoint diversity as we can. Now, we don't say Republican, Democrat, but here's how we do it. Well, for local elected officials, we actually do do Republican, Democrat, but we'll do faith-based leaders. We will do business owners, operators. We'll do college professors, law school professors from different disciplines, both community colleges, state colleges, private universities, all of that. And there's actual, one thing you don't have at the NSDA is all but one of the judges in my articles was under the age of 25. Think about that. You have a bunch of sub 25 year olds who we know where they are on some of the biggest issues in the country. We just saw that Harvard poll from a couple week, a couple days ago uh, from the Institute of Politics. 67% of 18 to 25 year olds said that Jews are oppressors, 67%. And so if you just have young people judging debate tournaments, you just have progressives judging debate tournaments. That's a, unfortunately a fact. And so when we pull from the community, when we pull from different industries, different professions, different disciplines, we get viewpoint diversity. The judges get trained on how to separate their politics from what they're actually judging. And then we have a zero tolerance policy on a judge deliberately not being impartial. And so between all those three things, I think we're delivering on what 
the tradition of high school debate was, the tradition that you knew, that I knew, that Justice Gorsuch debated, that Katanji Brown Jackson, as much as I disagree with her personally, that she debated Oprah Winfrey, Josh Gad, so on and so forth, Ted Cruz. This is a really great extracurricular that students should benefit from. Yeah, it's interesting. I'm, I'm just spitballing here, but but one thing that comes to mind is if you could get some kind of a cash prize, I think it would be extraordinarily productive, especially if you could fly people out and be in person. Of all the lunatics we just saw in yes. that, to put to pit them in a final round with somebody with the people that you've cultivated your your top debaters and to record that and to put that out i that think that would be just extraordinarily uh, informative for the public absolutely we have to discredit their credentials the idea that that tournament we saw that that video was on a pedestal we have to put our own alternative which essentially is the traditional style of debate on a pedestal and what i'd love to see peter and i'm sure you would love to see it as well Let's take some of the progressives that they actually look up to, right? Someone like a Ro Khanna, I disagree with him on a yeah. lot of things, yeah. but I trust him to be an impartial adjudicator of a high school debate. I actually think that Elizabeth Warren, for everything that she's done in many respects that I disagree with, I think she should actually she could actually be an impartial adjudicator of a high school debate. It's this illiberalism that's mixed with leftism that makes it such a toxic combination. And so your suggestion is one that I'd love to see an implemented incubate. Invite these top teams to come out, have them actually debate the topic, and have there be a cash prize. And let's see what happens. May the best man or woman win. Yeah, and for those uh, for for those final rounds, final debates, of course, in person is is far better than not. I, I went Absolutely. to ba Bates and Georgetown summer debate programs, which I got a lot out of. I don't know if they still do those. Uh, but it was extremely informative to me. Okay, so so you have your work cut out for you. Uh, if, so a few things. By the way, if someone wants to be a judge for you, is there a place where they can register to be a high school debate judge? Yep, they can just go on our website, incubatedebate.org, uh, and they can submit the uh, the contact form, and we'd love to be in contact with them to come out and judge. And when is your first, because Reed and I, we do a lot of traveling. When is your first uh, d debate? When, when, when are you going to get this up and running? Oh, so we've been up and running for four years now. I left the NSDA in 2019. No, no, uh, on, the, on, on ground, like, like when are you going to do a big kind of, or are you? Oh, we, we've already, yeah, we've, we've already done several of those. Uh, oh. our, our, next, our next big flagship event is in April in Jacksonville. That's our fourth annual Incubate Championship. That's the top students from the regions that we serve in Georgia, South Carolina, and Florida. The top 100 of the 5,000 active students in Incubate are going to be participating there. Um, that won't be the, the woke students that you saw in video, but we are working to put together some event where those students have to go and actually compete in traditional merit-based debate where you debate the topic. Excellent. I don't know why I, I thought I read that you hadn't had a, a, a maybe I read it wrong, but you hadn't had a big, so it's going to be in April. So Reed, let's see if we can go in April. And what would you want Reed and I to do if we went there? You know, I'm a big fan of street epistemology. Let's do it. Yeah. All right. That Let's that sounds cool. That sounds a good and of, idea. Of okay. course, to have you, to have you both judge, to have you both judge. Yeah, that would be, that would be an honor. That would be uh that would be really fun. Uh, I haven't. I did that at, at, at the last university where I worked. They had uh, something for high school students, which uh, was quite a catastrophe. But anyway, okay. So again, I even after seeing those videos, I, I know people are going to look at this and they're going to be like, "This is just too effed up." Like it's just. We have some people who think the institution can't be reformed. We have some people who think it can be reformed. I'm I'm going to leave aside the people who are in total denial. We are both in agreement. I'm kind of summarizing things in my head. We're both in agreement that it's better to do nothing than to learn a process that's going to take you away from reality. This process right. currently as is takes you away from reality. The real shame in this is that there's a process that will take you, that will sharpen the saw, if you will, that will, will sharpen the cognitive function and help you align the comp, just, just to be a better thinker more generally and to help help you articulate yourself. Okay. So, um, and I think if, if Jenny February 
March, April. I don't know where we're going to be, but I'd, I'd love to go, go down there and, and help you guys out to lend whatever support I, I can to what you do. Um, oh, it, it just while we're on this, in addition to judges, what else are you looking for? What, what can people here in the chat and people viewing this, what can they do to help you in what your mission? Well, we'd of course be grateful for their support and they can donate at incubatedebate.org. Everything that we do is no cost. That's one thing that I don't talk about enough, which is the idea that uh, compared to the National Speech and Debate Association, which is a greedy organization that charges kids hundreds of dollars a year to participate, leaving out working families who can't put up that kind of money, all the tournaments, workshops, camps, curriculum, professional development that we do is no cost in service to the students, families, and teachers that we serve. And so we're going to keep that mission going. And, you know, Amazing. one thing, yeah. Thank you for that. Thank you for doing that. Sorry, go ahead. Well, I was going to say, Peter, that the, the, the type of argumentation that we just saw in those three videos, it's called a critique, and that's spelled with a K. And this emerged in the 1980s in college debate, but really took over high school debate in the last five to seven years. And it's a way to reject the topic, to reject the assigned topic, and to debate some other concern, largely social justice concerns, that you have deemed more important. Here's the issue, is that this movement is not a grassroots movement at all. It's actually an astroturf movement that's being led by the governing body. So the National Speech and Debate Association literally has a guide on how to create critique arguments, how to reject the IMF argument and debate transgenderism, how to debate, how to reject the military, uh, the military presence in the Arab states, and then instead talk about how white Christians are destroying this country. They are literally teaching young kids to debate by not debating the topic and instead setting the topic that they want to debate and then debating that instead. And so that's what's so concerning here is they're not just presiding over and they're just passive observers in the corruption of high school debate. They are active instigators that are leading to the downfall of this activity. And that's what's just so troubling. That's why I know they can't be reformed because they continue to continue to lead to the degradation of this program. Yeah, I, I, I obviously am in lockstep between that. You know what? Here's the thing that's always fascinated me. If this is such a big deal, so so you have, let's say you just have a suite of conclusions. Trans is one, patriarchy is one, uh, global climate change is one, and let's say that's anthropogenic, caused by humans. Uh, another one is, uh, I don't know, saving the wetlands or something like that. I would do a meta critique of critique with a K of a K. And if I were doing this, I would argue that clim global climate change is such a catastrophe, a species-threatening event, that anybody who's talking about transgenderism is, in fact, um, the enemy of all of humanity and trans people among those. So it, it just it, it's always fascinating to me how and this gets a little bit into the free free will debate. I don't think people choose their own beliefs. I think that that we're all that there are these ebbs and flows and, and tides of belief that that people just latch into or latch on to. Um, but when I first read about critique with a K and heard about it, I thought to myself, this is really the perfect manifestation of the ideology, the perfect way to avoid any kind of uh, thoughtfulness and make sure that the ideology continues to weave its way into every domain of thought. Um, right. All right, cool. So let's do this. Uh, Reed, do we have any uh, any super chats? Uh, and Reed, boot the person who said who's made the derogatory comments about Jews, please. Um, if we have any super chats, uh, ask them now. Um, uh, if not, uh, what would you like to uh, leave people with? What kind of message would you like to send? people who who are either wondering why you and I think that this is so important or who are thinking, gosh, this really is important. I, I really want to help. I don't know if I can give money or be a judge, but I, I'd really like to help in some way. Well, let me first state that this country was founded on the basis of a debate, 
a debate about whether we should declare independence. And there were actually pretty interesting arguments on both sides of that debate. Then when it, a short while later, when that debate had resolved itself with the actual independence of this country, and later, of course, you know, the, the, the war, then it became a question of, wait, hold on a second, what type of governing document are we going to use? And then there was a debate about that at the Constitutional Convention. And then when we omitted important parts of that document, we had debates in the 1960s about civil rights and how we could protect the rights and how we could right the wrongs that we might have missed or overlooked in the first debate. And so debate is truly, the path to truth runs through open debate. That's just right. full stop, full stop. If you can't talk about our problems, then we cannot solve our problems. We saw firsthand what an existential threat the shutting down of debate did to this country for the past or for two and a half years, call it from 2020 to 2022, with respect to lockdowns, forced masking of kids, forced masking of forced vaccinations of young, healthy people. The lab leak hypothesis since you're on the topic. The lab leak hypothesis, the Hunter Biden laptop story, you couldn't share a contrasting viewpoint on social media and so on and so forth. And so it's not even about whether you agree with those particular arguments. It's whether we should have an argument in the first place at all. Correct. And so this is where I think we go from being a 50-50 on, let's say, abortion or maybe even on federalism or whatever, and we become maybe a 90-10 split. 90% of the country is still pro-American, pro-debate, pro-free speech, pro-viewpoint diversity. And it's the 10%, maybe even less, that's just straight up illiberal and doesn't even want to have any type of conversation about this. And that is the path to destruction if we just cannot talk about the no. issues that are impacting us. And so this is a much bigger fight. I'll tell you, Peter, you brought it up earlier that it's just so easy to become overwhelmed by what is happening in academia, colleges of education, and so on. I'm, I'm really excited about what we're doing with Incubate Debate because I view this problem as solvable. And I think if we, I do we too. win this victory, let's call it three or five years from now, if we can actually restore the tradition of free expression, viewpoint diversity, and merit to high school debate, that will be a major, major victory for our movement that we can then use and then ride that momentum, declare other victories. Because I'll tell you, you've got to, you got to put a feather in your cap. You've actually got to win. And this is something that we can actually win. We can't solve the Harvard problem. We can't solve the higher education problem in five years. I do think we can solve the high school debate problem in five years. Yeah, I, I, I think that's right. And I actually think we can solve the Harvard problem as long as she remains in there, then the whole place will crumble. Um, or at least be further delegitimized, which is my my goal. Okay, so this is great. I, I feel really good about this conversation. Um, I'd like to thank you for coming on today and talk to us. Where can people find you? I'm on X, uh, J underscore Fishback, the letter J underscore Fishback. And um, would love people to stay on top of what we're doing with Incubate Debate. We are serving 5,000 kids in Georgia, South Carolina, in my home state of Florida. And there's some really impressive young men and women who are coming out, speaking truth about some of the most controversial issues. And it's so exciting to see them really debate the way debate was supposed to be. Great. Well, thank you for your work. I think it's fantastic. Stick on afterwards. Thanks, everybody, for listening and commenting. We appreciate it, and we appreciate everyone who's trying to bring sanity like James to the world and bring back open, honest conversation. Thanks a lot, James. Stay on, and I'll see everybody later. Thanks, Reed. Thank you for watching. Everything we do is under the umbrella of the National Progress Alliance, nationalprogressalliance.org. It's a nonprofit, independent 501c3. Your generous donations keep us going and keep fueling content like this. So please help us out, make a donation. We very much appreciate it. Thank you.